session. During the next 45 minutes, you'll be listening to Manika Dan Raja Pan and Ashwat Kumar present Ator Authentication Token Obtain and Replace Burp Plugin V3. Please submit any questions you have during the sessions in the Q&A tab just to the right of the video in the Huva platform. I'll be moderating. I'll be asking Manika Dan and Kumar your questions in the last 10 minutes of this session. Please note that the chat function in Zoom is disabled for attendees, but you will you can leave comments and chat using the chat app in Huva. Manika Dan uh, is a uh, Razor Pay at uh, his interest in app uh, application security, API security, and cloud security. He loves to build a tool in security ecosystem that helps pen tester developers and security operations. He is also a speaker at Black Hat. Ashwat is a principal engineer at Razor Pay with prior roles at Synopsys and Microsoft Corps, specializing in cloud security, red teaming, and web application security. He's also known for developing birth plugins for advanced authentication and has presented at prestigious conferences like Black Hat, OWASP, SG, and Nullcon. With the introduction out of the way, uh, let's hear from Manika Dan Rajapan and uh, Ashwat Kumar as they share the insight. Thank you. Thank you, Parthion. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Let me just share my screen. Uh, and uh, good morning or uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashwat. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, Parthion already introduced uh, us. Uh, but uh, the, uh, these days, uh, mostly I'm focused on cloud API security uh, and uh, worked at uh, startups. So currently, I'm working at a startup, which is Razor Pay is a large payment gateway based out of India. And previously, I used to uh, do consulting uh, in Synopsys and uh, also Microsoft uh, in the past. Money and I all were colleagues. Uh, we are colleagues at Razor Pay and we were also colleagues at Synopsys. So we kind of started this journey uh, and building this tool uh, while we were consulting at uh, Synopsys. And I'll tell you a few fun stories. Um, and we presented at Black Hat, uh, Nalcon, Pocon, and uh, OWASP Singapore. Uh, I love playing ping pong money. Uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. So uh, I'm also working along with uh, Ashwin. So basically like uh, automation engineer within a security. So we'll be working with uh, spend testers, developers, how we can enforce the uh, lips uh, security towards to the developer and some uh, automation and SecOps. So I'll be working building the tools within a security. Uh, so we recently presented uh, in Black Hat. Uh, yeah. Awesome. So why specifically API security, right? Um, I think uh, you know when we built the tool, we started building it in 2020. And uh, these days, you know, as time has progressed, uh, most of the web applications are also kind of uh, working on APIs in the backend. Uh, this is mostly due to like JavaScript frameworks like React, Angular, uh, Vue.js, and so on. Um, and even internally, like if you think about Kubernetes, right? So there are a lot of APIs talking back and forth uh, between them. And uh, mainly the kind of bugs that we see are misconfigurations, coding errors, uh, you know, there's something to do with the framework business logic. But the core, core problem that pen testers and a lot of the bug bounty hunters face is uh, most of this testing needs to happen manually. And it's it's very difficult to run a tool that will go find all of these issues, right? Whereas in, if you take a web application, it's very straightforward. The first thing that you do is kind of log into the application, in spite of the application, then for all of the requests that are there, you go run like an active scan or a passive scan and work and so on, right? Uh, whereas to do the same thing in API is uh, a little bit of a problem. And that is kind of the starting point uh, of building this tool. And if you do observe like uh, on the applications that have been pen tested, the bug bounty hunters, you know, find a lot of critical and uh, P1 issues and they do get a lot of payouts. Right? So the, if you kind of go down the whole path, 
uh, the, one of the complex reasons why this, or one of the main reasons why this happens is because of the complex authentication setup, where uh, if you take a mobile app, there is a refresh and an access token, and uh, then there are one-time tokens, and there is basic card, there is JWT, and multiple different kinds of uh, authentication that is present. And also usually, you know, it's not a one step, right? Where you just put in the username and the password and you hit enter and you go out. So there are also some scenarios where uh, there is a single page where you put in a username first, hit play, hit on continue. Then the second page shows up where you put the password, hit continue. Then the third page shows up where you maybe enter like a one-time password and so on, right? Um, it is not as straightforward as it used to be in the past. And uh, today in our, in the demos today, we'll uh, show you some interesting scenarios, which is one is we'll take the most straightforward scenario. We'll jump on to, you know, maybe show you like something a little more complex. Then we'll move to like a super complex scenario, like a single sign-on. And in the end, we'll also show you how to kind of bypass like an OTP, right? Uh, SMS-based OTP. So we'll kind of walk you through all of the four uh, demos and it's going to be a demo in uh, heavy presentation. So uh, just going back to like the API piece, right? So this is, uh, you know, I picked this particular uh, GIF up from Mastering Chaos um, at Netflix. Uh, this is an excellent talk. So if you do observe, you know, multiple APIs are being called and it's kind of very difficult uh, to keep track and to do authentication. So this is just to give you like a high level saying, uh, the takeaway here is the, there are too many APIs and we need to have some kind of a wrapper or a handle on how exactly to test it, yeah, similar to what we did with web applications. So why did this, why did we build this whole plugin, right? Um, so during our pre, during my previous job at uh, Synopsys, the, uh, we had this particular fintech client that always gave us like a lot of APIs and, uh, every API had a different kind of authentication and uh, it was very difficult to get coverage, right? So there would be about 40 or 50 different APIs. And for to access every API, there would be a token. And to fetch this particular token, you had to pre-run another request, which would uh, pass in like a username and a password, and then it would generate the token. And this token would sometimes be only valid once. And uh, you had to take run this free request, get the token, then put this token elsewhere to test all of these 50 APIs. And... Uh, for somebody to do this manually, let's say, you know, on every API, if you had to run like a hundred test cases, you have to go re pre run this uh, hundred requests and then go uh, put this particular one time to compare, right? And it was becoming a big problem. And, you know, the pen testers were frustrated, the client was frustrated. So the V, and it was actually leading to real attrition. Uh, so the VP came in one day and he said, uh, Hey, I need you to go look at this problem and uh, you know come up with a solution which is one uh, scalable or go fix the immediate problem and then build a scalable solution so the first thing that we try to do is we try to work is the tool that you know we were using uh, during the pen testing and we try to write some basic wrappers or some basic python code which would take this substitute it there and so on uh, we tried with the native verb functionality using macros and so on but it was a pain and it had its limitations where you could only substitute it in the cookies or you could only substitute it in the headers and um, it would not understand JSON body and so on, right? So then we said, okay, we'll write some basic Python code, but this Python code was not very configured, right? So it was meant for a specific application. So every time a new application came in, we had to go change the Python code and it was not very scalable, right? So the, taking a step back, the first place we started with was macro. Second step was with Python code, Python code was uh, it did uh, work for the solution, but it was specific to that particular API or that particular scenario. Then the next step was to build a graphical based UI solution where uh, somebody should be, it should be easy to configure uh, and it should be easy to use for the pen testers. And it should be configurable for most use cases. And you should be able to pull data from different places in the response and go plug it into different places in the request, right? So pull data from, let's say, the body, go put it in somewhere in the header, pull data from the cookie uh, piece, go put it in both the header and the cookie, or pull data from the body and go put it in the request body, right? So we had to create something which would be configurable and also at the same time, you know, it should support multiple data types, right? So this was basically the concept uh, you know, while we were while we were beginning to build the tool, 
and this was kind of the v1 and the v2 version in the v3 version we have made more enhancements and you know we can also do transformations before the pull and the replace so you can pull some data from here you can base 64 encode it or url encode it and then you can substitute it here right and we'll show it in one of the demos as well okay uh so this was the appreciation we got it was all natural marketing we since it was peak covid we could not go present it at any conference and uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, really good pen testers and the bug bounty hunters also appreciated the tool. And uh, if you do look at Twitter or if you do look at some of the bug bounty pages, you know this tool is like highly appreciated. And it was all organic marketing, right? Because it really solved a problem for people. That was the reason why they, you know, they really liked it, and that's the reason you know why they uh, started using it. And you know, the only thing we did was write two medium blog posts and put it up on the uh, B app store. Right. So uh, taking a step back, right? So if you want to kind of, uh, so where exactly does this whole piece come into play? Right? So let let's just take a step back. Uh, and money is going to show you an example where it can become uh, even more clear. So let's say you have a web application that you are testing. Uh, the token is valid for let's say ten minutes, and uh, you know you log into the application. Uh, you put in your username, you put in your password, and if there's an OTP, you put in the OTP. You log into the application, you spider the application. Let's say you get fifty URLs, and then all of the fifty URLs you just go hit uh, run an active scan, right? So the first nine minutes or nine minutes fifty nine seconds, everything will run. The minute it hits the tenth minute, uh, the session token will be invalid, and you'll start getting like a four zero three error or a four zero one error saying, "Hey, the token is invalid," and all of the requests are going to fail. Right? So pretty much all of your testing is failed. So how exactly do we fix this problem? So the first thing we need to understand is step one, like what is the login sequence? That is, how do you put in like a username? How do you put in a password? And how do you get the session token? Out, right? So. It can be one token or it can be multiple tokens. So basically, you need to get some kind of a session token out of uh, the step one. So then the step two, like what exactly defines the piece which says, okay, the session is invalid, right? So it could be a 403 error or it could be like uh, any error, like 5x6 error or whatever, some some kind of a status code, uh, HTTP status code, and some kind of a message uh, right in the body which says unauthorized or session invalid. Or session token is not valid, and so on, right? So that is step two. So we need to identify like the regex for this particular pattern. Then the step three is once you run this login sequence, you need to pull a particular session token. So what is the regex to pull that particular token uh, out of the response of the login sequence? And finally, the step four, like whatever you pulled from step three, you'll have to go replace it in a request somewhere, right? So how exactly do you achieve this uh, step? Four is the uh, last piece. So just uh, breaking it all up again. First, did you identify what is the login sequence? Like how do you put in username and password? Then log in, get a uh, session token out of it. That is step three. And uh, step four is you go replace it elsewhere uh, in the in all of the requests. Maybe it can be in the cookie, in the header, or so on. And uh, the step two is kind of identifying what is the error pattern to say okay, the session is in the so off to your money uh you know let's look at some uh examples and uh, you know, let's have some fun yeah sure so basically the uh we're the I, the core idea will be remain same the four step process but uh, uh, to help you understand we'll start with very basic and then we'll go medium and then we'll go complex and one we have recently introduced with the otp validation so the first example is like very straightforward application say for example you put the username and password here and then you'll get a token and that token you can't directly take and then use it in the other requests that may be the application we have seen it but in this case, we see really interesting, like uh, you have to take the value and then that is the, uh, you have to do the base 64 encoding. And then you have to put that or keep that token for uh, within that or. So all other requests which keeps on coming from the scanner or repeater or whatever it is, it will use the token. So that's where it really differentiate between the uh, uh, like macro and then extended macro and everything. 
because we are not keep on triggering whenever we see 404. We keep do it once and then keep the token and uh, without asking you or without asking to re-trigger, we'll use the token for up to how long it is valid. When after 10 minutes as ex uh, example, uh, the, again, the token will go invalid and then again, one more login sequence, then keep the token. So in that way, a lot of network calls will get reduced. So this we will see in while doing the consulting job, right? The client will ask uh, why there are so many requests, uh, so many things, right? So everything was planned and then we have designed it in that way. So this example, I'll take you through. So when money is setting up, right? So the piece that uh, money was trying to explain was, uh, you know, let's say, let's take the 10 minute example. So at time zero, you have logged into the application manually, you are letting it run. At 10th minute, it expires. So you run the login sequence once and you can fetch a new token. So then for every subsequent request after the 10th minute, let's say 10 minute, two seconds, it will not run the login sequence. Again. It will only run at the 20th minute when the session is passing. So we'll we'll kind of keep that session token in memory all the time. Okay, basically this is the application which we took as an example. So what I did is like I put the username and password in assigning, and then uh, so you see this the, there are a lot of links will be there. The scanner will do the crawler and then it will do uh, do the user elimination and everything, right? Uh, so if you see here profile money test right and then i'll show you the example also and there are a lot of things so if you see the birth thing there is uh the token is getting i have already take the birth file for this application so if you see here uh this token is actually passed in all the request so whatever you do this token will be authenticated on the server side so now say for example after 10th minute this token is getting invalid now, if I send this request, I get four zero four four zero login time mode. So basically, I have to log in again, and then uh, we have to take the token, right? So I'll quickly do. So this is the step number two. We find the error condition, and the step number one is like you have to put the uh, username and password, and then you'll get a session token. This session token you have to take and then do the base 64 encoding and then replace it here. Then you'll get a 200 and keep the token within Autor itself. Uh, so all other token will be replaced automatically. So unknowingly, uh, the token will be replaced automatically. Okay. So this is the request which we have sent. And uh, if I show you the Autor, this is a UI configuration. Okay. So error condition, obtain token, and then error condition replacement, then the preview panel. And then you have the settings. You can do the import and export and everything. So this will really helpful when you do the C C D kind of thing. Say, for example, you have the application and then the login sequence will not going to change, but there are multiple features which people can pushing it, right? So you can really take this JSON and then keep it with you. Uh, and whenever the application is getting onboarded, and then if you want to do the headless burn, that is also we have tried it. Uh, you can just load this jar file and along with the JSON file. So you, it will automatically load. Whenever the build, uh, build is getting pushed, you take that application, the URL and everything, and then uh, you replace it in the JSON and then import it and then do the scan. So going back to this, we found the error condition. So that is nothing but this. So I'll send this request. I have to send it to error condition. And you have different things, status code, you can keep on looking. This is the triggering point. At what point the macro has to, at our macro has to execute it. Status code or something in a body or you want to check in the header. So in this case, 440 is fine. So I have added the status code. Step number two is fine. Now the login sequence. So the login sequence, in this case, it's very simple. This session token, and you can send it to, I'll come to this point. There are multiple things which we can do it, but how you can take the token is like you can just select this value and then do the from selection. And if you see here, automatically start string and stop string will get automatically uh, identified. 
sometimes you will get an error like we have the the tool is not able to find the start and stop string so basically this is the regex button okay and uh, to make it more uh, easy or understandable this will also work but i'm just giving you the example you can just copy what is the start string and the end string and then automatically this will get added here and here we'll name it as session open and you have option called encoding right so take this value and then do the base 64 and keep it in the in memory so that's that's what the statement wants so now i'll add this now i have done so step one is done now coming back to step three where do i replace it so this is basically this is the static value like a colon or something they have encoded it so this is the last four character is not going to change with this application so what i'll do whatever is going to change i'll just select it select that value and give the from selection and then the value will automatically come here just to cross check it because sometimes you are not aware what is actually being put into the replacement position so always check this one now we will do the open replacement and then i'll take this extracted value from here and then it will go into replace it on here add a, so you can add multiple conditions I think uh, we might have lost uh, money for a few seconds. Uh, so uh, the other thing is what we can do is we can, uh, so basically just summing up what money said, right? So the first piece is like the error condition. Then the second one is where we try to obtain the token. And the third piece is uh, where we try to replace the token. Money, I think we lost you for a few seconds, but yeah, I think you can uh, we, uh, you summarize the point. And the, why don't you explain the fourth page? Okay, so basically this uh, fourth panel is nothing but the dry run. Uh, you can just uh, run this and then you can just uh, see how the things are happening. So if I click on the test run, it is actually giving 440 and then it is actually running the login sequence and then now you see the 200. So basically this 440 is changed to 200 with this at our execution. And the interesting piece is now if you send the request to server, you'll get 201. Sorry, this one, 200. This token is actually we are sending, but the ATAR is actually taking this token and do the replacement and then send it to server. So if we change it here, you'll see it in live. Let's go to the application. Yeah, so the name is actually changed. So this is very simple, straightforward example. And uh, with this, you can go and then export and then keep the JSON file. Whenever the application is getting onboarded, you can just uh, uh, do the same thing. So this is scenario number one. The next piece will be scenario number two. This is the application which we have took. And then you see uh, the login sequences have multiple requests, like two requests here. You send a request, get a cookie, and then token, and then replace it on the second request. And then it will go give the final cookie. And that cookie will be used in all other requests. So here the step one will be this login sequence and then step two will be finding the error condition. In this case, four or one. And then you'll see where you have to replace it. So this is the uh, example. Uh, I will quickly go to the... And again, the complexity here is uh, in the login sequence, there are two places where you need to replace it. And uh, also on the error condition, you know, there is no base 64 encoding per se or there is no pre-processing. So 
you just take the cookie value from there and you go close it. Uh, so that's basically what it is. And both these websites were listed on Bakra. Uh, so these are uh, uh, websites that were actually on Bug Bounty. And even if you think about the Gmail login, right, it's a multi step. So, first you enter your username and then you enter your password. Even uh, for such scenarios, uh, the automation can be um, using your password. Okay, so this application which took it and then uh, I just signed it. I just want to give the uh, highlight about what the application is. So just a simple thing, just a single sign in and then you see the account name with my name, right? So let's go to the book and then I just uh, take you to how you can configure this uh, two request. So if we go to the repeater, so this is actually the API which is under test. Or the web app, if you think about like the top level domain is under test. Okay. From the API perspective, I'm thinking I just want to do some enumeration on this. Okay. Uh, if I send it, uh, this token is not valid. Uh, let me check. Okay. Yeah. Four, not one, right? So this is the error condition. And if you check with the previous scenario, Earlier, it is like only one request, you get a token, but here you'll get a two requests. You have to send it and then take something from here and then put it on the second request. And then finally you'll get a token. So this token is actually the uh, token, which is actually keep on uh, passed on every other request, upcoming request. So if I can quickly show you how we can configure it, I'll take this one as an error condition. So this will be my error condition. Let me go and configure this. Status code will be 404. This is not really needed, but I'm just uh, giving you there will be the option like you can tell the body also if the body contains this string so we have added two condition now we'll go to the repeater and find the login sequence so this is login sequence request to one and then we'll take request two so from here what we want to take from the request one you send it and then you'll get a cookie value, this one. I'll name it as lp one or response one. So I'll just add it, no need of encoding and everything. And this is the token two. I'll just name it token RS1. So there is no need of encoding it. Just add this. So now we'll go to the second request. So this is how you have to configure it. Do one by one. Take the cookie. This is the cookie where I need to replace my thing. So what I'm going to replace is like this one. This is going to be based on this. And along with that, we'll have the token. So I'll just say token sponsor one. Yeah. So these two things will be replaced. Then finally, we need the final one. So this will be the cookie which is actually needed or which we are really interested in. So we'll add it. 
So we're done with the login sequence with the multiple chain of request. You can add multiple. Next scenario will be that. So finally, you have to do the replacement. Along with that, I'll tell you the option up here. You can enable it and then say condition one and condition two. And then this will be actually final rejects back then. I'm just selecting this. And then extraction name will be CFP2. And name it as final token. Let's add it. Oh, I want to log in. This is the first request which I have sent from repeater. Now I'll go to run this. So it will match two condition. And if that matches, it will trigger this. And then take the token, replace it on the original request that you will see in the downside modified request. So we'll send this. We get a 401 and then 200 and then 204. And then finally, we get a 200. Now if we send it. So now we have the token. Because of that, if you send this request, it will replace. So there is no extra request which is actually passing. So if you see here, this is from repeater. The first time I send it, it's 401. And then this time, the la two, three, four, five. This is basically the extended activity by dry run. And then the final piece is actually the repeater. So the repeater sends the request before going to the server. It is actually seeing is there any token I have to replace it or not. If it is find a matches, it will replace it and then it will send it to the server. So the server side, the network call will be very low and you the speed and the coverage will be uh, uh, very high. So we have the option to enable and disable. I'll just to show you here. Yeah, I have disabled it. So I'm getting 404. And the same thing, you can export and input. So this is scenario number two, which multiple requests you can use as a login sequence. Good morning. Uh, just along those lines, right? Uh, I, uh, in the interest of time, uh, let's play the video for the yeah. SSO based login, right? Uh, yeah. So the takeaway from this particular demo was uh, the login sequence had multiple requests uh, and uh, multiple replacements. Uh, and uh, uh, that was the key uh, thing that we wanted to show here. Then in the SSO, you know, it's it's super complex. The error sequence kind of remains the same, where you know, 401 is thrown, and uh, a cookie has to be replaced because it's the same website, the Tata Wiki. But uh, in this particular scenario, we're going. To, can you go to the next slide, then? Uh, slide 14. In this particular scenario, where we use Facebook uh, SSO, and uh, it's super complex. So the, just to set this up, it will probably take like 15 minutes. Uh, so there are four requests that are sent. So what happens is when you're on Katawiki and you click on SSO, there's a redirection to Facebook. And on the redirection, you know, there's a set cookie that is 10 underscore or, okay. And then it goes to the OAuth uh, piece on the right side. And from here, there are about four requests that are sent. Right? So on the four, uh, you know, there are four values that need to be replaced uh, and uh, between response two and request three, six values between response three and request four, three values and so on. And finally, after this is done, there's a callback that is sent back to katawiki.com slash callback, right? So there are two values that are sent. So all of these configurations would not have been possible without ATOR. And this is kind of how we've used ATOR to make, uh, to set up all of these configurations. Um, so can we play the video now? Uh, so basically, I'll just walk you through this. Uh, so it is actually doing the same application only, but we are doing with the Facebook as a login. So the username and password, we are putting it. And then this application is also same thing, like the previous application, like there is a last one cookie, CW hyphen uh, underscore P, right? So that is the cookie which we need. We took it in the other way, like Facebook login. And uh, this is the application. And let's get into the verb file. So I have already exported those uh, uh, JSON. 
but these many requests are there. If you see here, the final request, update username. So we have to use the token here. This is the invalid token, which is giving 401. And then we have to find the login sequence. So this will give you the redirect URL with the client ID and everything. Replace it on the second request. So now it is going to the facebook.com from the Kata Wiki. Two, three, four, five, everything is on the Facebook side. So you take it and then do multiple replacement. Uh, there are five to six replacement is happening in this three and four. So you have to extract six to seven values from three and then put it into the four. So these values are coming from login.php. And if you see here the email ID and then encrypted thing is going along with the client ID and the state and everything. So that's the fourth request. And the final, re the fifth request on the Facebook side uh, is like with the state and then you'll get the authorization code. And this code will be used in this Kata Wiki to authorize. And then finally you'll get a CFP token. You see here, this token will be taken and then used it for the request, whatever it, from the scanner or repeater, whatever the scope you have mentioned it on the ATA, that will come into it. So we will just quickly import it. It's, it's really take 15 minutes to 20 minutes just to do everything in a proper. So we'll just export it and then we just are showing the data. So if you see in the downside, the status code is like 404 and then request one, taking this and then putting it to the request two. So the same, whatever I have explained to you in the repeater, right? The same thing is happening here. And there are a lot of things, right? Extraction and replacement. So if you understand that application, like, oh, uh, and then you can start, uh, then it will be very easy. So the first time you have to do that manual thing, like what is actually passed, where to put and everything. And the regex pattern, please careful while doing it. Because when you click the from selection, then automatically something will come and put it into the text area, but that is not the actual area which you want to do it. So always keep an eye on it. And these are the values which is actually taken. So again, the same, same scenario. I'm just forwarding it. So and this is the final token. And the final token will be replaced it here. So this is the regex pattern which we are telling where to replace the final token. Out of all the six requests, we get a one token, right? So that token where to use it. So we have to find the regex. So that is what happened in the third time, third panel. And if you see the logger, all the extender is actually doing its job from the test run. So 404 is finally changed into 200. So that token will be used further. So if we send it from repeater. Now the token will be automatically replaced. So the core remains same, even if it is a simple or complex or intermediate, but uh, uh, the login sequence and the understanding of where we are taking, where we are replacing, that is very simple. Just to add one more thing here, right? Uh, so SSO itself, uh, setting it up might be a pain, uh, but once you do it for one application, then SSO with Facebook becomes very easy, right? So the only thing that you'll have to change is the interchange between uh, the application to Facebook. So that is the left box to the right box that you'll have to take care. And the last piece where it's coming from the right box uh, to the from Facebook back to the application. That's where you'll have to kind of uh, uh, take a look. Um, but for most pieces, the right box will be the same. So yeah, like yeah. I was saying, right? the right box will kind of remain the same. Only the interchange from the left box to the right box will change, and the right box to the left box. Okay. And the final piece is the OTP piece, which is like super interesting. Uh, let me talk to you. 
Yeah. So this is basically like we took a sample application uh, that, uh, but uh, just want to understand that, but that is not the real way of just showing login and the OTP, but uh, we will show you how we have done it. So we have just hosted simple application on our local host, and then we are just doing it. Uh, so again, the same process, uh, you find the error condition, and uh, this time we will find it on the uh, body with uh, with the status code 200. So we was just looking for some condition on the body and then the login sequence will have three, three register, take a cookie and then go for register and then take again the cookie. This cookie will be used in all other requests. But in order to make that succeed, you have to do the OTP uh, validation. So you take it and then generate the OTP. So this is third request and then it will go to uh, your mobile and then you take that OTP and then you put it into the third uh, the fourth request and then this will get authenticated and then finally you'll get a response. So the token again will be using it in all other requests. So here uh, for uh, we are not using it on the mobile so we have something called my SMS. So I'll just uh, walk you through the video. So this is the sample application which we have took, and uh, the scenario will be something like this. So when you want to register it, you have to get a OTP. So the flow is something like if you want to get automatically registered, uh, or the error condition is like when you are logging with the invalid username and password, that is not yet registered, right? So basically, the registering part is actually the whole login sequence. So we will just play this. So right now we don't have any user with this email ID and then password. So this is the front end view or the application view. So you see the username does not exist. And then we use my SMS. So this is basically like you can see the uh, AP uh, OTP on this uh, web console. So we are using basically in the back side, we are using the APIs. This is the same thing. Uh, this is the error condition. The login is not present. So what we have to do, we have to do that four step process, uh, the login sequence, but include four requests, pre-register, register, and then generate OTP and then verify OTP. So here the verify OTP is there, right? So this OTP, we will fetch it from external party. In this case, we are showing my SMS, but it can be anything. You can just uh, uh, configure it. Earlier, we use something with the mobile itself. We installed APK and then we have tried it. Uh, but when we make it very generic, so we thought, okay, my, uh, my SMS could be the right way. So we are importing that and then uh, you have to do this configuration like API key and then the password and then the sender name is nothing but uh, the name which comes to your inbox, right? Uh, the profile name or the username, like who is actually sending it because it's keep on checking all the requests. If you have multiple requests, then it will take so much time. Uh, and one more thing what it is doing, once it read, it delete the messages. This is purely for a testing purpose uh, from like the consultant people or the pen testing who want to do these kind of application. They can just log into the my SMS and then register with them and then get the AP, uh, AP key and then the password. And the center name, you can keep on changing it. So that's all. So we have little extra step here that my SMS thing. And then it is making an external call. So the user, the login sequence is this one. 200 with username does not exist on the body. And this OTP will be fetched from the external party. And uh, one more thing you want to see here, right? In the left side, get OTP from SMS. So pick from extraction, right? So now you get the understanding of we are extracting from the previous request and then putting into the next request, right? But basically this one OTP, we are not putting it from, extracting it from the previous request. So something we have to be in the placeholder or you can say that for this request, it will go to the my SMS or something. When the request, when the order is getting executed, when you see the extraction name with this, it will go to the my SMS and check for a particular uh, key uh, and then get a token. So that is the only thing you have to take care here. Now we have a single condition and then where we are going to replace it, that's all. So now if I send this request, it is taking some time because it is going to the external party and then it is reading the message and then it is actually doing, uh, deleting the request on their side. 
uh, and then uh, it is actually putting into on this the post verify. So now we have send the OTP and then it is waiting for the verification code. If you do the same thing on the US side, you will see the same same process. So we are just uh, trying to replicate the same thing. And you'll see the output uh, on the extender, how 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 frequency it is doing the check. And finally, we get the message and that 18831, right? So that is actually the OTP, which is pulled from the MySMS with the IP key and everything. And then now it is it is it is taking some delay, like 30 seconds or one minute. Like uh, it is actually deleting it and then getting an API call, right? So that's why the request. If you, if you change this to any other external party, I think the the process will be very similar. You have to do the changes here and there. Finally, you'll get this one, right? That is the OTP, which is pushed to the previous, by the previous request. It, it, it went to that and then it found that, and then now you get 302. This username and then password is actually registered. So they have the login. So now if you try it with them, with that user credentials, you are able to log in to that application. Yeah. And just uh, one additional thing, right? So in this particular use case, it was more around registering an application, but this will be very useful when you're trying to log into an application and it asks for an OTP, right? Uh, it's very difficult to automate that or rather almost impossible. Uh, so that's where you know we use this particular workaround uh, to register uh, to get the OTPs on a phone number on this particular app called MySMS, where it gives you a phone number and all of the OTPs can be fetched using an API call. Uh, so we use that to kind of go get the OTP, fetch the OTP, and then send it in the response. So that's basically you know, what we do. Uh, next slide. And in this particular re release, you know what we have done is we have added the MySMS feature. We made it more easy to configure. And uh, also we have a added pre-processing that is the basics before encoding, decoding, URL encoding, decoding, and uh, also faster execution. That is no duplicate uh, request if a uh, session is valid. Uh, we would request or encourage all of you to go try it out. And if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me or uh, Mani. Uh, you know, we're more than happy or leave uh, PRs or comments on uh, GitHub. We are more than happy to uh, uh, talk to folks. So any questions? While people are asking, are writing that question, can you tell us how the JWT or CCRF token are handled when we initiate automation testing on web application? So CSRF token is fairly straightforward. Uh, I think it will be very similar to the scenario one. And money, if you can uh, open up the blog post, uh, so in, we have covered the exact CSRF token in our blog post as well. Uh, so, you know, it gives like, we take the specific scenario where the CSRF token comes in a header and again, uh, you know, we replace it, uh, the search for birth for me. So we replace it again in the requests header. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So that is something, uh, you know, that can happen. And similarly in the JWB token as well, so it either comes in as a key value or it comes in as uh, the, uh, or in the header value or in the body. So that replacement is also possible. Uh, so if you look at the blog post, right? So the first one specifically talks about uh, how to replace a CSRF token. Yeah, the, the UL bit a uh, little bit changed, but you see here that username and password, you get a token and a fresh token, right? And then that will be used in the header, and then you'll get a token. So basically, uh, that 
uh, passing that request and getting the token will be your login sequence and then error condition you can take some example uh, like send it to repeat error and then make that 401 or something which you really want to look for it and then that will be the pretty straightforward thing and uh, by the way uh, it is on here in the github page you can uh, look and then you can put your issues there in the pull request or the issues if you want to further contribute or you can ping me or rush me. so this is a little, little bit more like 2020 but the ui uh, is uh, changed completely make it's very easy to understand what we are doing and everything so it's simple to say but when you get an application you need to understand where you are doing it what you are actually replacing it otherwise it will be messed up uh token one and then token two the naming and everything so these are the things which i have learned over a period of time so whatever application comes just understand how the flow is happening and then do the proper configuration with uh, the naming convention so that you will not confuse it with the token one and token two and it will be really hard to debug it again Any other question? Okay. Uh, how many multi-stage login sequence on modern web application are implemented today? Um, is the question how many are implemented? Or... Uh, how multi-stage login sequence okay, how? Okay. on modern applications um, are implemented today? Right. So uh, multi-stage... Uh, so the first piece is with respect to multi-states, right? So like I explained the Gmail scenario where you enter your username first, click on continue, then uh, you know you go enter the password, then click on continue. And if you have like an SMS, then there will be like another uh, web page that goes on. So that's like a three-step process. And even in our demo with uh, SSO with Facebook, right? You saw four different requests with multiple value changes. Uh, so th that's kind of uh, like this particular example, right? So if you look at this, there are multiple requests going back and forth before the authentication is actually complete. So this is more on the SSO scenario, single sign on. Uh, is there any built-in technique available to handle complex login scenarios like OTP-based authentication? Yeah, so uh, for OTP specifically for SMS, uh, I think, you know, we have configured with the, the uh, tool called MySMS. So that was the demo number four that you saw where you go put in the API key and, uh, you know, you can configure that. Uh, but the only place that you would have to do manually is uh, if you look at the bottom, that is in the particular request where the OTP has to go, you'll have to add that as a parameter and you'll have to configure the MySMS API key like uh, money showed in the demo. And uh, maybe we'll do this. Uh, I think we'll uh, just uh, open source the videos. We'll put up the videos as well. And also maybe we will uh, add the config files so that if anybody wants to make changes or play around with it, uh, it will be helpful. Okay. Uh, nothing else. Then thank you very much. Uh, we had a blast presenting today. Uh, uh, you know, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And uh, Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you for the wonderful insights and for the demonstration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.